This is a shark. Everyone knows what sharks look like. A powerful, perfect body designed to kill. Thousands of razor-sharp teeth that can even bite through steel wire. Sharks can reach high speeds underwater through the contraction of their strong muscles. At least that's how we humans see the shark. And this is Nemesis Lamne, a tiny parasite. And for it, a shark looks like a bus, or maybe even an airplane. Basically, something that can be used for comfortable travel across the ocean. Colonies of small crustaceans called Nemesis Lamnae thrive on the sandy floor of the Atlantic Ocean. These organisms, no bigger than a bean, are not able to harm either the plants surrounding the colony or small fish living in the algae. These crustaceans take a few months to mature here, all without food. Seemingly harmless, these creatures are dangerous to only one creature in the world, a shark. As soon as the sharks show up nearby, the crustaceans cling to their bodies and run along their bodies to reach the gills. It's there, between the gills, that their main habitat lies. The crustaceans cling tightly to the gills, piercing the gill tissue with the sharp spurs of their limbs. These creatures breathe oxygen that enters the gills, feed on shark blood, and actively reproduce. The parts of the gills that are affected by them swell up, making it difficult for the shark to get oxygen, and the shark literally begins to suffocate. Over time, the parasites become increasingly more detrimental to the predator's gills. When the shark dies because of crustaceans, its body doesn't sink to the bottom, as it does in all other cases, but floats to the surface because of the abundance of gas in the gills and vessels. After the shark takes its last breath, when the blood flow finally stops, dozens of crustaceans emerge from the gill slits and jump off the dead carcass and slowly sink to the bottom to start looking for a new victim. Sharks have more than just the lethal crustaceans in their gills to worry about. They also suffer from helminths, which are a problem for nearly all shark species, except maybe the little hound shark and the leopard cat shark. They should thank their habitat for that. These sharks prefer cold waters and thus save themselves from the prospect of being eaten alive. The others are much less fortunate. Helminths eating the fearsome sharks from the inside are found in every tenth shark. These can be the nematodes, Phlactain ophora lamnae, which are hollow tubes filled with embryos. As soon as the female lays its larva, it meets its demise, and countless little worms start filling up all the hollow organs within the shark's body gradually growing in size. The number of these worms keeps rising. There are also monogenean parasites called Leptocotyle minor. Here they are, looking like little white dots on the skin. Ocean scientists report that the infestation rate among sharks is as high as 97%. So if you're a shark and manage to stay healthy, it's nothing short of a miracle. I'm beginning to think these predators are so aggressive because they feel itchy all the time. Monogeneans parasitize on the skin in the head, fins, mouth, and nose of fish, causing erosions of the epidermis and even necrosis. There have even been recorded cases of sharks infected with Helminth's Neodermophytherius harkema right in the aquariums. Sick sharks have rubbed against rocks in the walls of the aquarium because of the intense itching. Flat sores emerged on the tissue surfaces, serving as breeding grounds for parasites. These sores produced a lot of thick mucus, which contained tiny larvae. It looks nasty, to say the least. Imagine what this probably feels like. Another parasite that targets sharks is called Miamiensis avidus, and it works in a very different way. In April 2017, a great number of sharks were washed up on the shores of San Francisco Bay. Something penetrated their noses, then their brains, and ravaged them, causing the sharks to lose their orientation in space. Well, you probably know what that something was. I've already spoiled it. Eventually, confused sharks would end up stranded on the beach or just dead. For a long time, the cause of the shark's condition remained unclear, until an expert extracted the cerebrospinal fluid of several individuals and sent the vials to a lab. That's how Miamiensis avidus was discovered. It's a small, single-celled organism that looks like a hairy almond. It actually passes through the nostrils, travels up the olfactory tract, and plants itself in the brain. Once infected, it's no longer possible to cure the victim, and it dies in most cases. An expert estimates that more than 1,000 leopard sharks and 200 to 500 bat rays were washed ashore in the Bay Area. Additionally, a number of other species were affected, such as hundreds of striped bass and dozens of common smoothhound sharks, halibut, thornback rays, and guitarfish. 
Once dissected, it was revealed that these animals' brains were completely ravaged. This is what the brain tissue of an infected shark looks like under a microscope. The blue dots are parasites. Can you see how many of them there are? Some shark carcasses have been found to have severe necrotic and inflammatory brain lesions. That's not something you could survive. And if you're starting to get the impression that sharks are just some kind of breeding ground for vermin, well, that's actually right. A huge number of all kinds of small creatures choose different kinds of sharks, such as fox sharks, great white sharks, hammerhead sharks, blue sharks, and many others as their hosts. And parasites live everywhere on shark fins, in their gills, and their noses. Experts even claim that some parasites eat shark snot. Doesn't look good, but who are we to judge them? Parasites live between the teeth of the great white shark. One species even hangs from the eyeball of a Greenland shark like an earring. Not the best place for a piercing, to be honest. And this begs the question, why are there so many parasites in the first place? Well, it's estimated that they make up more than half of all the species on our planet. On the one hand, this makes the remaining inhabitants of Earth, including you and me, a free-living species. It sounds nice, but at the same time, it means we serve as hosts for parasites. One might even say landlords. For example, humans can carry more than a hundred different critters at a time. Scared? In that case, you should feel sorry for the sharks, because they have even more parasites. Actually, it's worth saying that not all animals carrying parasites are necessarily sick and suffering. A blue shark, for example, can carry a huge number of cub pods, a hundred on its fins, 4,000 in its gills, and 400 in its nose. Also, a fairly healthy blue shark can carry about 10,000 individual tapeworms, turning into a floating hotel for parasites. Turns out that parasites are some of the most successful organisms in the world. Unlike those other animals who are stuck fending for themselves, they're simply living in luxury. Pity on us. After all, the host provides the parasite with a constant supply of nutrients and a cozy habitat, or to put it simply, free food and shelter. Imagine you're living in a rented house where your landlord not only doesn't charge you any money, but also takes care of your food expenses and cooks meals for you. I think people usually call that kind of landlord a parent. Don't think that I'm making another parent's analogy, but there are also parasites that are able to manipulate the mind of their hosts. Moreover, they force them to become successful. A new study shows that wolves infected with the parasite Toxoplasma gondii are more likely to become pack leaders than uninfected wolves. Of course, animal behavior is influenced by many familiar factors like experience, genetics, but we now know that a parasite may also be on that list. Toxoplasma gondii is a single-celled creature. This is what it looks like under a microscope. And this is how it makes mice behave. Actually, the parasite's not too picky and is so widespread in nature that it can infect any warm-blooded animal. At any given time, it infects at least one-third of the world's population, causing a disease called toxoplasmosis. Although the infection is usually mild, it can be fatal for young people or those with a weakened immune system. But we'll come back to humans a little later. As I said, this parasite is known for its ability to manipulate its hosts. If it gets into a non-feline host, it can settle in various parts of the body, including the brain, and live there for years. That's because the parasite must end up in the cat's gut to reproduce, and it has a couple of ways to reach its goal. For example, rodents infested with the parasite are more active and less afraid of predators, which helps the parasite reach its preferred host. Yes, the rodent literally provokes the cat to eat it. What's more, some rodents even become attracted to the smell of cat urine. But the strange behavior doesn't end with mice. Chimps infected with, or should I say possessed by this parasite, are attracted to the urine of leopards, their natural predators. Infected cubs of the spotted hyena are more likely to approach lions and get killed by their claws and fangs. It's time to see how this parasite affects humans. People who are infected also tend to engage in riskier behavior compared to others. For example, they drive more recklessly and therefore often get into fatal car accidents. But the consequences are not always so dire. One study involving college students and businessmen found that those infected were more likely to either study business or start their own businesses. And in countries with higher rates of infection, people were less likely to cite fear of failure as a reason for not becoming an entrepreneur. As I said, this parasite doesn't care who it infects, and it does it all the time. 
No wonder Toxoplasma gondii is considered the most successful parasite in the world today. Today, it infects people on almost every continent, and once infected, a person becomes a carrier for the rest of his life. Yeah, she read that right. So far, we don't have a cure that can get the parasite out of the body, and there's no vaccine approved for use on humans. It's estimated that 30 to 50 percent of the world's population is infected with Toxoplasma gondii, and a recent study in Western Australia puts the number of infected at 66 percent. In general, even the most conservative estimates show that every third person on the planet is a carrier of the parasite. And if there are three of us here, me, Steve, and you, the viewer, then according to the statistics, some of us are definitely infected. I'm not entirely sure if I want to know the answer, but here's what I've been wondering. Is our love for cats somehow inspired by the parasite? After all, it's known for preferring felines. Our video seems to be missing something. Steve decided it's zombie snails. That'd be a very slow zombie apocalypse. Okay, kidding aside, there's a parasitic worm called Leucochloridium paradoxum, whose intermediate hosts are actually snails. The parasite's MO is really simple. The snail eats the infected bird droppings, and then the parasite matures inside it. But it needs to get back into the bird. To do that, the parasite, shall we say, makes one of the snail's eye stalks swell up and turn striped green. This is what the eye stalks of a healthy snail look like. And these ones were affected by the parasite. You can see them from afar, and Steve and I agree, this is indeed hard to miss, because not only does the eye stalk become caterpillar-like, it also pulsates. As if that weren't enough, the parasite manipulates the host's behavior, making it stay in better illuminated areas, sit on higher spots, or even become more active. See? It sits in the lit area so that it can definitely be spotted. And what bird would refuse such a treat? Eventually, it tears off the eye stalk and the parasite returns home, where it lays eggs, which then hit the ground again with the droppings. The cycle starts all over again. Interestingly enough, this cycle can be repeated for a very long time. The eye stalks of the snail that were torn off by the bird regenerate, and the parasite goes inside them again. And who else might suffer from parasites? Oddly enough, Asian giant hornets. The whole point is that parasites don't recognize the notion of, that's a creepy critter, I better keep my distance. In July 2022, Japanese insect enthusiast Abira Masura saved a hornet's life by removing the parasite from its belly. Fortunately for the hornet, the man turned out to be not only an insect fan, but also a vet who was able to use tweezers to remove the gooey white worm from it. The large parasite turned out to be a female from the Strepsiptera order, which attaches to hosts such as bees, wasps, grasshoppers, and leafhoppers. It's also a creature that devours its mother from within. The little female parasite penetrates the bodies of all sorts of insects, where it then waits patiently while the young that stays inside its own body devours it from within. Eventually, they burst out of their mother and emerge from a still very much alive insect host. This is what newly hatched larvae look like. And yes, that's them on the bee. More than a million new parasites can emerge from some grasshopper. Wondering what that is? The head and chest of a female that's about to sacrifice itself to the offspring. Counting more than 200 species, the Strepsiptera order may well be considered a collection of the most intelligent and violent parasites on the planet. Unlike many other parasites, they have no interest in keeping their host alive. They use the hosts and then rip from their bodies, leaving wounds that can't possibly heal. The males look as you'd expect, with wings, antenna, mandibles, and big, beautiful eyes. Well, beautiful from an insect perspective. What about the females? They're different. The expert calls them bags of eggs for a reason. The female has nothing. No eyes, no antenna, not even mouth parts, nothing. It spends almost its entire life in the host, so it just doesn't need all that. Evolution has turned the female into an oval of flesh. Here's the male again. And in this photo, it's mating with a female that's inside the wasp. And this is what parasites look like when they look out of their host body. They emit pheromones to attract males. When the larva of this parasite enters its host, its sex is determined. Females can only live inside grasshoppers and males can only live inside ants and bees. Moreover, the parasites penetrate the host without leaving any traces. And it's still a mystery to scientists how they manage it. 
In addition, parasites bypass the host's immune system. In short, they're so good at all things parasitic that I wasn't surprised at all when Steve told me that Strepsiptera were on Earth a hundred million years ago. They were found in amber. And as long as the hosts of these parasites don't start dying out, I think they'll be around for quite a while. But don't animals do anything to get rid of parasites? Turns out that some animals understand when they're sick and can even do something about it. The theory of animal self-medication known as zoopharmacognosy has been observed in the macaws in Brazil, elephants in Kenya, and even dogs and cats in the United Kingdom and the United States. For example, although eating grass makes them nauseous, domestic and wild dogs and cats around the world actively eat it. But not because they're hungry. Even a well-fed pet tends to chew on grass. It's believed to be a way for animals to relieve stomach pain and get rid of anything that causes intestinal discomfort. Researchers have also observed chimps more than once swallowing an entire plant called Espilia, which helps treat parasites. The leaves contain a chemical known as Theorubrine A, which kills some intestinal parasites, and the roughness of some plants can act as sandpaper to remove them. But that's not all. Red and green macaws are known to eat kale and clay to help with digestive problems. Pregnant elephants are also known to eat the plant Borrigan Assiae, which is not part of their normal diet. The same plants are used by women in African regions to induce labor. Apparently, the elephants know what the plant does and seek to have the same effect. But back to the parasites. Instead of eating grass and clay, you can choose a simpler strategy and keep them out of your system. Unfortunately, the animals themselves haven't gotten around to this idea yet, so people help them. When the Falornis downsy fly was accidentally introduced to the Galapagos Islands, it quickly brought many local bird species to the brink of extinction. Fly larvae began to attack chicks right in their nests, crawling under the skin, sucking blood, so ornithologists decided to help the birds. Studies have shown that the treatment of nests with insecticides for a week before the chicks hatch can reduce the number of parasites. But here's the problem. Some species nest too high above the ground, and it's not easy to get there. And yet a solution has been found. You just have to appreciate how clever it is. The affected birds build their nests from grass, twigs, and feathers, so the scientists decided to give them chicken feathers pre-treated for parasites. And it worked. Fewer parasites, more rare birds. Everyone's happy. Well, maybe everyone except for the flies. But they aren't really welcome here. See you later.